Never miss our updates and be part of our conversation squad. I am delighted that the organization has grown so well. I don't think any other city has got this kind of an organization which consistently arranges such good lectures. I was actually asked to come last year, but I was busy with my book deadline. And in a sense, that is good because I could speak today on the 75th year of our constitution. Although we became a republic on the 26th of January, 1950, the final approved constitution was introduced and passed in the Constituent Assembly on the 26th of November, 1949. And that is why the 26th of November was initially celebrated as Law Day, and now it's celebrated as the Constitution Day. 75 years is a remarkably long time, particularly because in a study conducted by Professor Tom Ginsburg of the University of Chicago, he studied all written constitutions from 1789. And the average life of a constitution has been 17 years, one seven. So it is indeed remarkable that a country as diverse, as different in religion, culture, language has stood by this constitution. So there must be something good about this constitution, something noble about this constitution. And what is the secret sauce? What is the special ingredient that keeps it going for 75 years? It all began on the 2nd of, 9th of December, 1946, when the Constituent Assembly first met to draft a constitution for the forthcoming independent India. You'll be surprised to note that the Constituent Assembly sat for two years, 11 months, and 17 days, and finally on the 26th of November 1949, the final draft took shape. The initial constitution was 243 articles, with 13 schedules. Even then, it was the longest constitution. And I don't know how many of you had the chance to see the constituent assembly debates. They are on the net now. Uh, various eminent people were members of the assembly. You had the most outstanding Indian minds who were part of the assembly. And a total of 7,635 amendments were moved of which 2,473 were either adopted, dismissed, or accepted. And finally, you had the constitution, which was 395 articles and eight schedules. At one stage, it was widely criticized as being too bulky, too long. And in a very important speech made in 1948, Dr. Ambedkar explain why this constitution was so long. And my talk today is divided into two parts. I'm going to look back for a short while and then try to place what I think are the challenges which we are going to face in the next 25 years. Looking back, Kama, the constitution was criticized by no less a person than Pandit Nehru saying it's too bulky, it is too long. A constitution should be like a beautiful avenue of trees. This is like a large forest. Various criticisms were made. And in an outstanding speech, Dr. Ambedkar mentioned that, look, we are a nascent, we are going to be a country. We are faced with communal strife. The country is in turmoil. We don't have, as he put it, constitutional morality. Now, constitutional morality, as people say, is not just moral, immoral, as we understand in a normal sense. Constitutional morality means, and this was coined by Professor Dicey, all of you will know that Britain does not have a written constitution. They just go from conventions. 
There is nothing in the British constitution which say a prime minister must resign if he loses a vote in the house. There are so many conventions which are simply followed from time to time. There is nothing which says the speaker should be independent. So, Professor Dicey remarked that from 1685, 1700 onwards, Britain has developed conventions and constitutional morality requires you to respect conventions. You don't need a written law. Your constitutional morality lies in following conventions. And Dr. Ambedkar said that we are still a young nation. We had the Government of India Act of 1935. We have not developed enough time to develop conventions. Therefore, to avoid ambiguity, to avoid doubts, let us put everything in writing, let it be laid down in the constitution. If you study the history, there were subcommittees, they studied the constitution of the United States, Japan, is, uh, Ireland, Germany, and then finally we adopted this particular constitution. Now in all fairness, I must say that the bulk of the constitution is based on the Government of India Act of 1935. But the two most important changes which are fundamental and which have made us live for 75 years is part three, which is the fundamental rights, and part four, which are directive principles. So you find that we have got a constitution which there is much to celebrate about as far as we are concerned. If you look around our neighbors, in the same period as we, Sri Lanka has changed the constitution thrice, Pakistan five times and Nepal six times. So this is the background of our constitution and why we need to appreciate that it is a tribute to our people, particularly the electorate, who has from time to time through adult franchise, through exercising votes, have ensured that the constitution continues. And as I will point out, why, what the role the Supreme Court played in making the constitution now virtually permanent. Now, if I had to look back 75 years, it will be difficult to encapsulate everything in a short span of time. So I've decided to reduce the time for the past because most of us know it. And the initial years of the constitution, the 50s, was a huge tussle between agrarian reforms, lands being acquired, no compensation being paid or little compensation being paid, frequent amendments made to sustain zamindari laws. The government would take over land, pay a pittance of compensation, the Supreme Court would strike it down, they will amend the constitution, and so on and so forth. And what happened was, from 1950 to 1965, the constitution was amended 17 times. There was a doubt as to whether Article 31 is a fundamental right, right to property. And what was disturbing was the ninth schedule, where if you put a law in the ninth schedule, suppose you put say the Andhra Pradesh Zamindari Abolition Act in the ninth schedule, you can't challenge it in a court of law. You can only challenge the constitutional amendment. So by 1965, the constitution had been amended 17 times. The Supreme Court held that parliament is supreme, they can amend any part of the constitution. They can change whatever they want. The power is supreme. But as the years went by, as more and more inroads were made into fundamental rights, in 1965, a landmark case came, and this is the most important case, which really is a turning point, where no less than 17 laws were placed in the ninth schedule, and parliament said, no, no Supreme Court can't question it. Now, can you question the constitutional amendment? That was yet to be decided. And those of you who are students of law here, you should go to the judgment of Sajjan Singh versus State of Rajasthan and see the judgments, the minority judgments of Hidayatullah and Justice Mudholkar. They start getting worried. You see, the irony of our constitution is, if you want to amend the constitution, you require only two-thirds majority. But if you want to amend a small provision like a state amendment, state-related law, you have to amend the constitution with two-thirds majority and also get ratification of 50% of the states. So you can remove your fundamental right to free speech by a special majority, but if I want to change something regarding the Andhra Legislative Assembly or the state assemblies, I have to get it ratified by all the states. So Hidayatullah puts it very beautifully. He says that our fundamental rights are plaything of the majority. Are there something which the majority can play with? If I've got two-thirds majority, can I change whatever I want? Mudolkar 
which I believe one of the finest judgments of the history of our Supreme Court, he goes into it deeply. He expresses his anguish and disturbance. And he asks the question that what is the meaning of the word amend? You can amend the Constitution to any extent. And he raises a very fundamental point. He says, suppose I amend the Constitution, I remove the right to free speech. I remove the right to life and liberty. Then do we have a Constitution at all? If the essential features are gone, then what remains? And in a supreme irony, why I say irony is, Mudholkar relies on a judgment of the Pakistan Supreme Court, whose Chief Justice was a Christian at that time. Chief Justice Cornelius was the Chief Justice of Pakistan, and they said that the Constitution cannot be altered by removing its essential features. And Justice Mudholkar said, today is not the right time, but someday we'll have to consider whether an amendment can include taking away your essential features. Now the question arises, what are the essential features? And Mudholkar puts it beautifully, he says, look to the preamble, and there you'll find our essential features. The previous speaker mentioned about the preamble being read in the, by, in the church like, a God, like something divine deity, and it is. The preamble has basically four pillars, justice, liberty, equality, fraternity. Remove any one pillar and it's not a democracy. So he first sowed the seeds, and fast forward, in the Keshan Bharati case, finally Supreme Court came to a conclusion that, look, you can amend the constitution, you can do what you like, but you can't amend its basic structure. And what is basic structure remained to be undefined. So they said you can't amend the basic structure without saying what the basic structure was. They said we'll evolve it from time to time. And over the years, right to free speech, free elections, all these are held to be part of basic structure. And in 1973, I would say in the history of the first 75 years, the cr crowning glory is 24th April 1973 when the Kesan Bharati judgment was delivered and parliament by 7 is to 6, majority of 7 is to 6, held that you cannot alter the basic structure. Now you just imagine how perilously close we were to losing freedom. If it had been 6 to 7 and after the emergency amendment were made, we would not be sitting in this hall having a month and lecture. That is guaranteed. In fact, in my book, I have pointed out, it's actually not 7 is to 6, it is 6.6 .6 to 6.4. Because Justice Khanna agrees with the majority, he says, yes, and parliament can amend, they can do this. He only narrows it down to this part of basic structure. The majority says you can't take away fundamental rights, but he says, yes, you can do, but you can't alter the basic structure. Whatever it is, today, constitution at 75, you'll have constitution at 100, you'll have constitution at 125 because of the basic structure. Now, in the last 75 years, apart from basic structure, what are the key features? Keeping in, time, in mind the limitations on time, I would highlight certain important features in the past, which are something we can be proud of. And I'll also mention certain things which are worrisome, which are unfortunately blots or black marks on our constitutional history. What are the plus points? Apart from the basic structure, till 1967, when Pandit Nehru Shastri, the role of the Supreme Court was respected and it was left alone. The day the Kesan Bharati judgment came, the next day there was supersession of judges. The three senior most judges were superseded because they gave a judgment against the government and Justice Ray, who was number, number four, four, became, became the Chief Justice, the, the three resigned. resigned, and that became an unfortunate precedence where there was a tussle between the executive, the ruling party, and the judiciary as to who should be, what kind of judges should we have. There was open talk with Mr. Mohan Kumar and others, who they say that ju judiciary must be committed to socialism, committed to a social order, and so on. But a committed ju judiciary is an oxymoron. Either you have a judiciary or you have a bureaucracy. You can't have a committed judi judiciary any more than you can have boiling ice cream. So committed judiciary is an absurd concept which was rightly turned down by part. So the superstition of judges was a black mark. 
the other black mark was the em emergency where fundamental rights were suspended. We had the 42nd Amendment to the Constitution, which now it's for, thankfully history, which made the courts virtually powerless. To give you a simple example, if a central law has to be challenged, suppose tomorrow you're a businessman and you want to challenge the GST Act, no high court could challenge it. It could be challenged only in parliament. And even in parliament, it had to be by seven judges with two-thirds majority. So virtually the challenge became more and more difficult. Fortunately for us in 77, the electorate election threw out the uh, government of Mrs. Gandhi, restored the Janta Party, and the first thing they did was they removed all the amendments of the 46th Amendment and restored all the rights back. And they made today Article 21 cannot be taken away at all. Your right to life and liberty is permanently saved by the 44th Amendment. So the black marks, I would say, supersession of judges, the 42nd Amendment, the unfortunate trying to control the judiciary. But coming back to the plus points, post-emergency, the Supreme Court came in full vigor. The other minus point is Supreme Court upheld this law where the Attorney General said, I can shoot a person in the emergency and he has no remedy because the right, of, the right to life is suspended. Nobody has a right to life when emergency is declared. And that was upheld by the Supreme Court. As you know, just as H.R. Khanna, he dissented, a brilliant dissent. He goes into the Magna Carta, the whole life, and says that there are some things which are beyond constitution. Life is something which nobody can take away. And he gave a dissenting judgment. He was once again superseded, and he resigned. So these are the two black marks. Now, coming to the positive side, you had the public interest litigation which started, which gave the voice to a large number of people. Of course, there is a point of abuse, but every good thing has has got its abuse. But over and above that, I would say that the public interest litigation has been a great help and has addressed so many wrongs in the past so many years. And Justice Krishna rightly pointed out that public interest litigation made the Supreme Court of India as the Supreme Court for India. That was how he put it. The last major change, and I'll go to the drawbacks, is the recognition of the right to privacy. This is a very, very major important uh, change which the common man doesn't appreciate the impact of what this change will be, which we'll come to know in the years to come. Now, part three of the constitution has fundamental rights. You have right to free speech, right to practice religion, you have right to, uh, you have right to <coughs> equality, reservations are there. But there is no mention of right to privacy. The issue was raised in 1959, where there was a raid on some of the Dalmia companies, and some documents were seized. He says the documents are protected by right to privacy. Supreme Court said that there is no such thing as a right to privacy in India. That was by a bench of six judges. Then we came to a bench of eight judges in Kadak Singh's case, where a person who was criminal background, who was a decoit, he was constantly surveyed. He was under surveillance. He could not leave his village without the permission of the police. He had to report wherever he was going. His house could be searched at any point of time. And he could not move about without the constant police surveillance. And that was under the UP surveillance rules. Justice Subara, whom Andhra Pradesh should be proud of, Telangana should be proud of, he gave one of the most brilliant dissents and said, if this is the surveillance, then the whole country is a jail. He says, the, it's not just being locked into a jail which loses your privacy. Even being constantly watched is amount of privacy. But he was in the minority. The majority said India doesn't have law of privacy. Finally, it came to nine judges, where Justice Puttasamy was the public interest litigant, and we traced the history from the US law, other laws, and so on and so forth. And to cut a long story short, the Supreme Court has now held that the right to privacy is as much a fundamental right as a right to life and right to equality. Then the question arose, where is the right to privacy? Is it in Article 14? Is it in Article 19? It must have a home. It must have a place. It can't be in the air. So Supreme Court said the right to privacy permeates, pervades throughout part three. 
And what are the rights to privacy? The three dimensions of the right to privacy. Your physical privacy, your informational privacy, which is very important in the digital age, and finally, decisional autonomy. Decisional autonomy is your right to choose your profession, right to choose your partner, right to take a decision in your own way without violating any particular law. And this right to decisional autonomy ultimately read, led to declaring sec Section 377 IPC as unconstitutional, saying that the same-sex marriage, they said it's a decisional autonomy. We had the occasion of arguing it. That was another major landmark case where the Supreme Court recognized that an old law may have to be relooked at because of changes in science. Now, the Indian Penal Code was drafted in 1860. There, the section said, sex against the order of nature, carnal intercourse against the order of nature is a punishable offense and its punishment is very severe. So, homosexuality was completely a crime. This was a crime in almost all the nations, but over the years, number of scientific reports came, the Wolfenden report came, and it was established medically that in any given population, 3% of the population will have a same-sex orientation. It is nothing wrong, there's nothing, it is just happens. It's the, you may call it the act of God or whatever it is. In any group of 1 lakh people, 3% will have typically a same-sex orientation. And the Supreme Court said, we have got to recognize the decisional autonomy. If he wants to have a partner of the same sex, that must be recognized. And it was decriminalized. So, and the, the importance of that case is, just because a law is made 100 years ago, if science has changed, then the law must change accordingly. There's a very nice Latin maxim which says, cesante rationae legis, cesante ipsa lex. If the ra rationale for a law ceases, then the law also must so these are the important things which can be proud of over the last 75 years. We should not take it for granted. And now I come to looking forward. What are the dangers I feel? And I feel there are seven issues which I want to flag in front of you. Now these are issues which are bound to come up before the Supreme Court. Some are already pending. Three out of the seven issues relate to elections. And I think it's a matter of Irony, it's a matter of paradox, that free elections are the essence of democracy, but the election process itself is becoming a threat to democracy. And i tell you how. The first is the freebies, which are reaching unmanageable proportions. I had the opportunity of arguing Subramaniam Balaji's case unsuccessfully, where I, I come from Chennai, but I practice in Delhi. And Chennai is the, Tamil Nadu is the, home for freebie culture, where first you had the free water pots and then the free dhotis and the free saris that kept on getting escalated election to election. And finally, in one election, the DMK announced free color TVs and they won. Landslide victory. Next election, Madam Jailita announced free laptop, free mixer, free grinder, free fan, uh, one five gram gold if you marry outside your caste. All these things were promised. So we challenge this saying that, look, under Article 282, public money cannot be used for these purposes. There is a U.S. Supreme Court judgment which says, public funds can create only public assets. You can't use public funds to create private assets. You have a community TV, have community computers in classrooms and so on, but you can't distribute laptops. Where you open it, you get Jailita's face, which are then sold in the black market. But Supreme Court dismissed my case, our case saying that, now this is, Truth, it may sound like fiction. Supreme Court said by giving color TVs, the women in Tamil Nadu are getting educated and don't know what's happening in the outside world. So it's, it's part of directive principles. It's a social reform thing by giving free TVs. Now this has gone on, on, on and on, and some ways freebies. We told the election commission, because when you appeared, the Supreme Court issued notice to the election commission. I said, why don't you put as part of your rules? They said that we will consult all the parties if all the parties consent, then we'll agree. It's, I, I don't know how all the parties can consent to freebies, you know. Yes, I mean, it's a paradox. Those people are doing freebies. You are the regulator. You must put a check. It's like saying, asking all taxpayers, should I pay tax? And only then I'll allow the tax. So anyway, so that was the thing. So this is a major problem, which I think only can be done by legislation. That's one thing. Second is the issue of defections. 
This is one of the most serious problems which has to be addressed. Now, defections, if you see the statistics, because I gave a memorial lecture in the Bombay High Court and I had occasion to study the 10th schedule, the statistics are staggering. Up from 1950 to 1967, there were only 136 defections. In 67, 68 alone in one year, there were 400 defections. And if you read the book by Subhash Kashyap, from 1950 to 1985, 4,000 persons have been elected to various assemblies and so on. 1969 have changed the party. So the defection rate is 52.5%. Somebody has changed the party. And that's why you've got this name of Ayaram Gayaram. Now, when I did research, I found that there is actually a person called Ayaram Gayaram. He's not in the storybooks. There's a gentleman in Haryana called Gaya Lal. He got elected in 1967 on an independent ticket. In the next 15 days, he changed the parties four times. As an independent, he first joined the Indian National Congress. So independent to Congress could not be called as a defection because he's independent, so he's joining a new party. Two days later, he joined the United Front. That was the first defection. Four days later, he went back to the Congress. That was called by the Commission as a counter-defection. Then from the Congress, he went back to the United Front. So that is called a counter-counter-defection. And finally, he was, he came back to the Congress. And Chief Minister Rao Birendra Singh had a press conference and invited him and told the audience, Ye saab, ye Gayalal saab hai, abhi Ayaram hai. So that's how the name Gayaram Ayaram came. So Gayaram Ayaram is actual a human being called Gaya Lal. But there is a genetic problem because his son Uday Banu Lal, who's still an MLA, between 1987 to 2005, he also changed the parties four times. So now we may laugh, but defection is a very, very serious problem. Statistics show that 63% of the people who have defected have been awarded with ministerial births. The more dangerous thing recently, which was exposed by the Indian Express, 29 political leaders who had enforcement directors cases against them, who defected, 26 of them, the cases were dropped or not pursued after their defection. Somewhere we have missed, we have failed as far as the 10th schedule is concerned. And in my view, we have to amend the 10th schedule and make it very clear that if any person defects, he is barred for the rest of the term of that year. Now, there are many issues pending, disqualification of speaker, disqualification of member. So first suggestion I would make which would, is that any defection should be disqualified for the rest of the term. Two defections, you should not be allowed to stand for election at all. And at the moment, at least, the issue of disqualification should be referred to the election commission, not to the speaker. The speaker under the constitution is supposed to be bipartisan. He's supposed to be independent. He's supposed to be like a senior citizen, like, like a enlightened person who manages the whole house. But sadly, in all the states and all the uh, parliaments we have seen, the speaker has completely been partisan. And if a disqualification issue is raised, it is not decided for several months. And that is the problem. So the defection is the th second issue. The third issue, which is now one nation, one election. For the life of me, I don't understand what is the logic of this one nation, one election. It will lead to serious constitutional problems. You want one nation, one election, because you want to save money. One article by Mr. Achari says the total money spent on election in 24 was 580 crores. So money is not the issue. Now suppose you have one nation election. Let's say all of us get elected, they are one nation, all election. And suppose Lok Sabha is dissolved in two years. What happens? How are you going to amend so many provisions of the constitution? So these three points, defections, freebies, and one nation one election, will be a major problem and will cause constitutional strain in the years to come. The fourth point, which is very difficult and which has to be addressed, is the reservation issue. It's a delicate topic, but we have to address it head on. The constitution doesn't say 50%. Why not 34%? Why not 48%? The Supreme Court said that, look, 
there is a need for reservation. There is a need to give people a chance to get uplifted who have been denied so many facilities for, for social reasons, economic reasons. So you have scheduled caste 15%, scheduled tribes 7.5%, and then the mandal notifications which came was 27.5%. Now that was upheld. Now there has been additional reservation of 10% for economically weaker sections. The difficulty is not in the reservation per se, the difficulty is in the way the law has been interpreted. What the Supreme Court has said is, if you are in the reserved category, if you're candid, and you select and on merits also, then you will be taken in the merit quota, the, the non-reserve quota, and you will get your seats. That will not, and that will not be taken as a seat in the reserve category. The net result is, the spillover is so huge, and in, the Madras, in Madras in 2008, the total number of medical seats was 1,226. Only 34 candidates from the non-reserve category got admission in medical college. This is a complete spillover. Now, if you are, today all political parties are saying we should cross the 50% limit. It is bound to lead to social strain and we have to decide whether 50% is part of the basic structure or not. One question is 50% is part of the basic structure. So this reservation issue, and now it's going to be compounded by the recent Supreme Court judgment which says, even among scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, you can have sub-classification. So you're going to have, say, within 15%, you're a very vocal political leader who goes on fast unto death and so on, then he's given a seat, and this is going to lead to more and more problems. I remember a wonderful article written by Nani Palkewala. He also argued unsuccessfully the Mandal case. Mr. V.P. Singh says, now I can rest at peace. And Palkhila wrote an article in the Times of India, yes, the Prime Minister will rest in peace, but hereafter India will not be at peace. So this is an issue which has to be addressed and which will be a more and more problem, particularly because everybody wants that reservation should be proportionate to the number of castes and communities and so on. Third issue which I may say is federalism, which is again under strain. There are two parts of federalism. One is fiscal federalism and one is the center-state relations. Our constitution is supposed to be based on a strong center and states. Over the last few years, there is a tremendous strain on the states for, in terms of their finances. And the reason has been, it's been harped again and again, the reason has been that if you collect excise duty or customs duty or GST, you have to share it with the states. But if you levy a cess, then you need not share it at all. Cess can be retained by the revenue. The Sarkaria Commission, the other commissions have said cess should be only for a limited purpose. Say, for example, there's a defense cess or as a road cess. But cess has gone up from 8%, 6% in 20, uh, 2008. It's now become 18% of the total tax revenue is cess, which is not shared with the states. These are all points which are going to lead to further, further strain. We don't know what will be the ultimate consequence. The sixth point I would mention is, yeah, sorry, the other thing is on the center-state relations. What is the role of the governor? Is he meant to obstruct the functioning of these state governments? Bills are, not, bills are passed but not sent to the president. The role of the governor, as per the Sarkaria Commission, is a person who is like the president of India. He is there like an elder statesman who looks into, who, who is supposed to give moral leadership to the particular state. Now, this is not for this government. Every government has misused the post of governors for the last so many years. But somewhere or the other, it is going to trigger off some kind of controversy which will become unmanageable. So both fiscal federalism and this the way center states are functioning has to be a causes for concern. Other thing is the use of the central agencies against the state governments, whether it's the ED, whether it's the CBI. Many, many cases where now the states have said we won't allow the CBI to function. You must have read in the papers that Karnataka, so many other states have said CBI has no permission to get into this particular thing. Last point I'll raise is uniform civil code. 
in management we say that more important than a to-do list is a not-to-do list. What you should not do is more important than what you should do. And in my humble opinion, this uniform civil code, one nation, one election, all these things should not be done at all. For the simple reason that our problems are far more important. We've got problems of unemployment. We keep talking of vital and economy. Nobody refers to the GDP figure. Your GDP was lower than Bangladesh. If you've got 140 crore people, you'll definitely be 5 trillion because just adding 1,000 into 1.4 crores will make you so many thousand crores. So by sheer population you become. So we should focus on that and that is a very, very serious issue. And before I conclude, why I raise these points is, these are all small points. We don't know when it will trigger a revolution, when it will trigger some kind of unmanageable protest. And I don't speak in the air. You know, history tells us that at what point of time a thing ticks off, we don't know. I was very fascinated to read what was the f starting point, I mean, what was the trigger point for the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, the Russian Revolution? What was the starting point? The Printers Union, Printers Workers Union, those of you youngsters will not know what is a typeface, but those of us who have seen letterpress, you'll find a lead letterpress will have the alphabets and the newspaper would be printed with that letterpress. In Russia, they would pay small, say, one paise for the alphabet, but they did not pay for the punctuation marks. They said, we will not recognize a comma or a semicolon as a letter for payment. The printer said it is a one lead, whether it's an alphabet or a semicolon, it's the same work for us. They did not do it. They went on strike. That led to some other strike, led to some other strike, and ultimately led to the 1917 resolution. We never know what's the ticking, uh, tipping point. One, one fruit shop burnt himself in Tunisia, the entire Arab Spring movement started. Archduke Ferdinand of Sarajevo was assassinated in Sarajevo. It triggered, went off to the World War. So what I'm saying is these are all the points, defections, UCC, all these small, small points, if they keep on creating constitutional turmoil, then it is bound to lead to some point where it could lead to a tipping point and it could be a point of no return. As a lawyer practicing in Delhi, how much of time we spent on the tussle between the Delhi government and the Supreme Court, Maharashtra government defection, how many hours are spent on these kind of, just Arvind Kejriwal's bail, how many days it went on? For what? It was not the law that a person doesn't have, I mean, Supreme Court has laid down, if you're not a flight risk, if you're not likely to tamper with witnesses, then you should be let on bail. Why should a man be in jail for 480 days and then only Supreme Court grants bail. Something is seriously wrong, which we have to think of. Now, to conclude, I have just tried to briefly summarize what are the highlights of the point which I wanted to, which I wanted to flag with most of you. There are other issues also. Actually, as much as the Constitution, I'm more worried about the economic part of the country, but that's outside my topic. The interesting thing is, I've always believed that there's some divine body protecting our country. There's some, something divine here. When I was in college in Bombay, the emergency was declared. I still remember the editorial page of the Indian Express was blank. Some black marks were there. So we all thought that the end of the world, that India is never going to come back, we're going to be a permanent dictatorship. But came 77 and we had democracy again. Recently, we were worried that they kept on saying that if we get 400 seats, then we'll alter the constitution. Again, the electorate came and they said, they had us check and said that, look, no, we will not accept this. And one thing that has been proved over the past few elections again and again is, the ordinary voter or the so-called voter whom, not the urban person, is far more astute than we think. Secondly, he knows exactly what he wants. I had appeared for some agricultural institutions. One point which I realized was how important it is to restore the Panchayati Raj. When I was appearing for these farmers, how important it is. 
We have amended the constitution. We got panchayats, municipalities, but nobody has enforced it. I'll tell you an interesting story. We are fighting against a sugar mill, which used to collect water in the upper river, make alcohol, IMFL, that is the, the uh, spirit, and just put raw waste into the lower river. So we got an order to stop the mill, etc., etc. So I was discussing with these people, and at that time, it was the time when the Panchayat Amendment had come. So he said that, look, in our village, the people from the government, they have no appreciation of what we want. If you give it to the Panchayat, what does he want? They wanted a proper crematorium. That was the need. Secondly, they wanted two roads leading to the school village. Now, these small problems could be sorted out only with the Panchayat, and we don't need centralized thing. So I'm also worried about the economic growth, about how we are going to solve this problem. And all this incredible India, G20, will not really sort out the issue in the long run. We have to address to the core issues. Finally, I'll conclude by saying that I started by quoting Dr. Ambedkar, whose speech on 25th November was why the Constitution was long and so on. And I will end with a quote from Dr. Ambedkar. He puts it beautifully and very touchingly. After all the hard work he did, I mean, his entire team did, so many other eminent members were there. And he says that, now I'll read his actual words. The working of a constitution does not depend on the nature of the constitution. The constitution can only provide the organs of government, the legislature, the executive, the judiciary. However bad a constitution is drafted, it will work well if those who are called to work it are a good lot. But however good a constitution may be, it is sure to turn out bad if those who are called to work it are a bad lot. So he says, I can only provide the framework. It's up to you to work it. And I would suggest, I have just three minutes to go. I would, just, I would suggest that what is the solution? What is the course of action? It again lies in the Constitution. Once we start thinking beyond the next election, once we understand that getting to power is not time for revenge, time for getting return on investment, but time for governance, the solution is in the Constitution in part four, which is the directive principles. We talk of the preamble, we talk of the fundamental rights, but very few of us read the directive principles. They're beautifully drafted, largely borrowed from the Irish Constitution. It talks of the necessity of employment, living standards, adequate means of livelihood. If you only focus on the directive principles for the next five years in your elected term, the most of the problems of the country will be solved. And I will a quote, end with a quote by an author, Sir James Berry. He makes a very good observation which applies to individuals and should apply to a nation as well. He says, and this is very important, he says the life of every man is a diary where he meant to write one story but actually wrote another. And his humblest moment is when he compares with what he has done with what he had vowed to do or promised to do. In the same way, our constitution has given us the fundamental rights, given us the directive principles. It is up to us to work it and to protect it. And I conclude by saying that with the basic structure, I, I can rest assured, all of you can rest assured that this constitution will celebrate its 100th birthday. There's no doubt about it. Even if a government has 400 or 500 seats, it cannot alter the basic structure. If there is going to be in India, there will be it will be because of the basic structure. And I thank Manthan for inviting me for the first lecture. I've come for the 13th lecture. And I would suggest to all the organizers that Manthan, I'm sure, will grow from strength to strength. Your basic structure is the love and the help of the Hyderabad people who like your organization so much. And like the Constitution of India, you will celebrate the next 25 years and my only request is this in 2049 in your october 2nd monthan keep a slot
constitution at 100, looking back, looking forward, and I will come and speak. And I'll only end by saying, it'll be the nicest birthday gift a 93-year-old man will have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Datar. The only thing I can say is in Hindi, aapke muh mein ghi shakkar. May I uh, open your yeah. so, uh, session for question and answers? Uh, friends, we have just 10 minutes, and we'd like to choose some questions. Yes, there's a young girl here. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, it is broadly a great consensus that artificial intelligence is the future and it's uh, rapidly developing. Uh, but with the development comes uh, dangers and misuses like deep fake videos. Uh, do you think the constitution in regards with the right to privacy will evo evolve in the future to accommodate the development of technology while also protecting the society from its dangers? If so, how can it be done? Yes, a very important question. And uh, what I'm more worried about is, we talk of artificial intelligence. It is not just artificial intelligence. It is the, in, uh, the use of data which can lead to serious invasion of privacy. I don't know if you know Cambridge Analytics. Uh, we did this case with privacy when it came. A human being has 52,000 components. And by just following what you're doing on Google and on the net, I can identify who you are, what you are doing, what is your thing. And in the US, they use this to identify Hispanic people to whom loans were refused. There's a US Supreme Court judgment which says, if I keep a GPS in your car for 90 days, in 90 days, I'll know everything about you. So with data comes a serious invasion of privacy. Now, since I'm working with these groups, the GDPR, that is the European thing, is very strict on the privacy issues. Most of the countries are giving a more liberal approach. It's very difficult to draw the line. If you want Google Maps, you want Uber, etc., then they are bound to know where you are going, etc. So it's a trade-off. How it's going to solve, we don't really know. But it's not artificial intelligence. What I'm more worried is the state trying to use this as an excuse to inroad into our privacy. And I'm happy to tell you that we succeeded before the Bombay High Court recently. I appeared for the Federation of Journalists. The government introduced in the IT rules, informatical rules, something called a fact check unit, fact check unit, FCU. Now, under the IT rules, as you said, suppose your privacy is invaded, something is mentioned against you. There is every social platform, large social platform, has to have a grievance officer you can complain to him. Within 72 hours, your complaint has to be addressed. There's a grievance appeal mechanism, and then there is a high court. But this fact check unit, the government would form a unit, and if that unit, whose constitution was not known, felt that any information is misleading, no social media could publish it. So suppose they want to black out something in Manipur or something else, because the media is the way in which you could get entire information. They could be stopped. So the Bombay High Court struck it down, saying that it is overbroad. You can't, the government can't use the dangers of social security, the, sorry, the dangers of the social media to curb the freedoms of the people. Actually, it's like a sliding scale. On the one hand is total freedom, on the other hand is total control. You'll have to draw some line where there is an element of control with freedom. In my view, the current IT rules, minus this particular thing, are very adequate. If your privacy is invaded, it will be immediately checked. And there is also something called photo DNA and other things. Like, for example, for child pornography and so on and so forth, the DNA identifies thing and then you assert and your accounts are blocked. Large social platforms block something like a couple of million accounts a year. Your complete access to social media is taken away. But it is a danger, but it's also a great boon. Um, yeah. I see some repeat hands going up, I must say. We have a policy of reservation of one question per head. So don't try. Uh, Sanjay Jasrani? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Tatar. Uh, that was an amazing uh, talk. So my question is about the last quote of uh, Mr. Ambedkar, which you used. Uh, 
about the legislature, the judiciary, and the executive. In recent times, one has seen that the judiciary and the executive is coming under tremendous pressure from the legislature. So in the seven points which you mentioned about constitution and what could come up, how does one get back the independence, the true independence of the executive and the judiciary when uh, one is looking at a sort of uh, gradual degradement of that independence? So my question is a little more specific, sir, about I have read about aspects like the Police Act Amendment, which would give fixed tenures to officers. So when one looks at CBI and ED and various UAP and other regulations being used by the powers that be to totally put down any form of dissent, and it leads to a lot of, I would say, fear among even judiciary and executive. How does one protect that? How does one get back the spirit of true independence is my question, sir. Thank yes. you. Now, just uh, as you, one of the points I'd mentioned was the separation of powers, but that's what you said, legislature, executive, judiciary. It's from Montesquieu, and the sense of a republican constitution is that the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary are the three organs of government, and the judiciary is always completely independent. Executive has to listen to the legislature. Now, this is complete separation. One of the important achievements, in my opinion, is the collegium system. It is the best system to get the judges and not the executive. But, you know, in a certain sense, what I feel is, beyond a point, the law can only do so much. Ultimately, it is the leader who must feel within himself that he is something beyond the next election. And that perhaps distinguishes a politician from a statesman, where you look beyond the four years and see what I'm going to do for the nation. Now, no matter what law you make, you can always subvert it in a uh, thing. That's why we call constitutional morality, spirit of the constitution, and so on. If you want to appoint the best judges, you can do so. You don't need any amendment. But if you want to say that he's my man and I want to put him there, then, then the problem starts coming. Or he gave some adverse judgment to him, so therefore I'll block his promotion, then that becomes a problem. So ultimately, it's just at the core of it. From 1950 to 67, when we did the NJC case, Every recommendation of the Chief Justice was approved, except once. It was never, never questioned. And just talking how this change comes about majoritarianism, authoritarianism. On this issue of bills, Pandit Nehru introduced a bill. The whole house was with him. The great Rajaji said that this, the bill has nine defects. And said the bill will be unworkable. So Pandit Nehru remarked, that may be your view, majority is with me. So Rajaji retorted saying, majority is with you, but logic is with me. And to the credit of Pandit Nehru, he withdrew the bill. So if that, that spirit is there, then... Aruna Bahugana? Uh, since you were talking about the different organs, hmm. I just wanted to ask about the constitution and the judiciary. Today we see that everyone else has checks on them except the judiciary. <laughs> the judges can speak what they want, how they want. We have seen recently, fortunately, the High Court judge was pulled up for certain remarks. At the lowest level, police produces witnesses in courts. The judge doesn't have time to examine all the witnesses, so says they are absent. The witnesses have not been produced. So court doesn't have to pay batta, and he is not questioned for not examining these witnesses. So what is the constitutional protection against judges? To, we've seen, you spoke about Kejriwal's bail, unheard of conditions. Yes, yes. And nothing done about it. It's still, this, those conditions still stand. Actually, uh, I must say that I fully agree with you. It is a really sad state of affairs, but it's a larger problem. You see, the norm is 100 judges per million. We have 14 judges per million. In the lower judiciaries, many vacancies are there. Supreme Court has to have a campaign to fill up the vacancies. When the exams are set up, I won't mention one state, out of some 3,000 candidates, only two were found to be fit to become a district judge. Only two could pass out of 3,000 people. So it's a large situation. What kind of law colleges you have? What kind of whole? It's the largest situation. So on the problem of areas, it's a very, very serious issue. But having said that, if you see statistically, out of the 22 odd high courts, 
54 percent of the areas are only in four high courts calcutta bombay madras and De uh, delhi in the district judiciary out of the areas 54 percent are in five states in many states the pendency is very very low like madras for example our pendency in civil is very high but in criminal we got the best record in the country four years ago if an appeal was filed it would be heard in 22 days that was the track record of the madras i could because of four outstanding judges so this is a larger problem now on uh, talking of judges uh, you're right silence is a virtue which is not very often practiced a one english person said that a much talking judge is like an ill-tuned symbol so i agree it has to be restrained the other thing what happens is very often these social media platforms what a they pick up a sentence out of context and it is published what the karnataka person said was not acceptable but i have seen very often a statement is made which is completely out of context so that is also a part but i fully agree with you judges must exercise restraint nobody is to check them they can't be removed except by impeachment and then you can't play god you have to be more and more restrained right i agree fully agree with you the judicial restraint is required